You ever done interviews like this before? No. Oh, this really? My first experience. Oh, wow. Well, maybe it's the first of many. Now you're going to be on demand. <laughs> well. <laughs> okay, thank you. <clears throat> Hello, I'm Steve Soderberg. I'm a music specialist with the Library of Congress in the Music Division. And I have with me today um, Martin Boykin, a uh, composer uh, out of uh, Boston and New York, uh, and formerly on the faculty at Brandeis. Uh, welcome, Martin. Thank you. Glad to be here. Uh, I'd kind of like to start this interview today uh, by going back in, into your early life. Um, one thing that we didn't talk about before was um, how early were your uh, first musical experiences in New York? Uh, I don't remember, really. I mean, I, I know I was playing the piano by the time I was three or four. Uh -huh. And um, I can remember, I always wanted to write music, and I can remember at the age of 12 that I decided to the music I wanted to write was, in fact, the Appassionata and Beethoven, <laughs> which I imitated and which hopefully it no longer exists. I'm sure it no longer exists. But, you know, uh -huh. it, it accompanied me. It's accompanied me all my life. Right. Uh, well, I know that, uh, well, we'll talk about um, um, piano lessons with Steuermann after a while, but uh, getting into your student years then, um, you studied with uh, Walter Piston at Harvard, right. I believe. Your your bachelor's was in 51. That's right. Uh, could you t uh, give us some uh, indication of what it was like at Harvard in those years and and, and anything you might have to say about uh, Mr. Piston? Um, what was wonderful at Harvard was the student body. Uh -huh. um, uh, and I'm speaking those uh, in music, the music majors, from whom I learned a great deal. Um, I do have to say honestly that the courses in the humanities and the arts were not very useful, with the one exception of um, courses in the art department where I was really taught to look at, at paintings, and I took a lot of courses uh -huh. of that kind. As for Piston, um, I admired, at, at that point, I admired his music a great deal. Mm -hmm. um, and I studied it, and um, he was very encouraging. Um, he said, frankly, that he regarded it as his duty just to be a spectator. Mm -hmm. And he really did not teach. Um, he obviously knew things, but unless you asked him, is this... Um, is this section too long, he wouldn't have criticized it. But if you ask that question, then he would say, yes, it's too long. <laughs> but you had to already know. Um, so you had to pull out of him. You, you had to know there was something wrong. Um, and um, otherwise, if you gave him a piece at the end of the term to look at, he would return it with uh, editorial corrections. Mm -hmm. Um, accidentals that you forgot, a, a ledger line that you forgot, but otherwise no comment. So it was mostly technical. Uh, uh, well, uh, not even technical, just editorial. Right. Not technical in the sense of right. these notes aren't working or this counterpoint is bad or, or whatever. Uh, but I do have to say his, the example of his music did mean a great deal to me mm -hmm. um, in those years. Um. Was there anybody else at Harvard at the time, an individual that uh, that maybe was uh, important to you, or was it that he mainly the? Uh, well, among the students, there was a graduate student who uh, was very important, to me, and that was Sam Adler, ah. whom I met at uh, in at Harvard, and he immediately took me on and became my elder brother, uh -huh. <laughs> and uh, I still see him as my elder brother. <laughs> Maybe we can bring him back at the end and talk about uh, what we were talking about previously. Sure. Sure. Uh, and then I understand that uh, you went to Zurich after you graduated right. from Harvard. And that's when you made contact with Paul Hindemith. Right. 
and uh, what was what was that like in Zurich? And and then you followed, or you didn't follow him back, but uh, but well, maybe you did. Yeah, is I that did. why you went to Yale? Yes, absolutely. It was because of him. Be then. Because of him, okay. absolutely. And I had I got my master's and uh, my right. MM uh -huh. at uh, at Yale with with him. Then. Well, it was a different experience than it was with uh, Walter Piston, I assume. <laughs> Night and day. Uh -huh. <laughs> Um, the details are, um, well, you, you only need to ask any of the students still around who studied with him. Mm -hmm. uh, the man was deceptive because he was very friendly, very easy to talk to, very lively, a charming guy, uh, whom I only subsequently realized was really rather tortured and unhappy. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, he had uh, he understood only one way of writing music. And the year at Yale, I remember that um, I began a new piece every single week mm -hmm. because I would bring a piece in, and then he would say, "I'll show you how to continue it." And he would write the rest of the piece or big section of the piece for you right there. Mm -hmm. And usually incorporating a German chorale from the Middle Ages. <laughs> um, and you know, it was no longer. <laughs> <laughs> my piece. Right. So I began a new piece, mm -hmm. and then I began a new piece, and then I began a new piece, and it was very difficult. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we actually got along well. Um, what I did learn from him uh, was the quality of professionalism. Because mm -hmm. uh, when he first asked me in Zurich, I remember, would you go to the board and write a melody? I thought, oh, a melody, you know, that's, you have to be inspired to do that. And I learned uh, there is something about just being able to do it, not worrying about the quality. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a way of learning about music. It's not a way of writing music. But, um, and so I learned some sort of, uh, I learned the professional skills. Mm -hmm. uh, not directly from him, but the fact that there should be professional skills. Mm -hmm. Did you f have a feeling that, uh, that uh, did you have difficulty I don't know how else to put it, uh, getting over him as a teacher uh, once you uh, not were not under him anymore. Really. I remember um, uh, at that time having the sc a score of Matris de Mala, not the orchestral suite, but the full opera, mm -hmm. which I still admire very much. It's an extraordinary work. Uh, and uh, that stayed with me for a few years. And then... Um, uh, I don't think he was in any sense a hindrance. Mm -hmm. um, I can't blame him for any <laughs> any of my <laughs> problems as much as I would like to, but I, I really can't. Um, but what I he said one thing in the in the course of those uh, of that second year with him that has always haunted me uh, because we began to um, you know have problems with one another, and he said, uh, you know, if people say I'm not a good composer, I really don't care. But I would die if they said I wasn't a good craftsman. Mm -hmm. And I immediately thought, but then why bother to write music? The word made it into a title of his, his book. Yes, yeah, the, cra the craft of musical right. composition. As though it's something you learn, like, uh, like boiling an egg. Mm -hmm. and. Um, but what that masked, he did care very much about the quality of mm -hmm. music. He really did. Mm -hmm. And I think what that masked was a sense that, and this is towards the end of his life, that he really wasn't writing the kind of music that he should. And I think of him as a, as a tremendous um, tragedy of the 20th century, mm -hmm. an enormously gifted man who decided music was becoming chaotic and he would put it in order because the world needed to be put in order. Uh, and we needed to reach, and I think quite rightly he thought we needed to reach out to all kinds of people. And so he developed a kind of scheme in which he wrote pieces ac uh, mechanically according to a scheme, and that is not craft. Mm -hmm. um, and I think he knew that. There's a I know he knew that. Uh, there's a wonderful... Uh, comment in, uh, in the uh, uh, manuscripts of Elliot Carter that we have here, 
Casper at one point, and as a matter of fact, I think it would have been about this this period of time uh, that yes, it was it was with the sketches for the Carter First String Quartet. He wrote above a line that he had written uh, to Hindemith, T O O. In other words, too much Hindemith. Mm -hmm. And so he, I guess, the reason I was asking you about difficulties with Hindemith was that he seems to have loomed large. Enorm on the scene at this Enor time. Enormous. And, yeah. Enormous. He was the composer, with the possible exception of Stravinsky, mm -hmm. who was not teaching mm -hmm. anyway. Okay. I after this after your uh, masters at Yale in '53, you went on a Fulbright to Vienna. Uh, could you give us an idea of, of of what it was that you did in Vienna and who you met there that became important? Um. Uh, what I did there, um, I didn't, I have to say, I, I didn't really meet, um, I met, we had, uh, let me put it this way, we had to enroll in the uh, uh, Universität der Stadt Wien, or the, the Akademie, mm -hmm. I guess what it's called. Um, and um, so I took courses, uh, I, I took a few courses, I wasn't that interested. I took some private lessons in conducting. I was really, I really used those two years to be on my own. And there were years in which I was uh, trying to figure out what, what to write, what to do. Mm -hmm. They were not easy years um, for that reason. So you so, were... You were composing throughout this time. I was, right? although just not very happy with. Uh, yeah, and not really write, uh, not really writing very much, uh, even though it wasn't really coming out. Mm -hmm. And uh, if I may take a second, Please. just um, uh, it's a little unclear in my mind, but around that time and uh, a few years after, uh, this is since you mentioned Elliot Carter, a few years mm -hmm. after. Um, I really uh, had trouble figuring out, uh, having a sense of what to write. And I, I did read a lot of quantities of Schoenberg and quantities of, of uh, sessions, I remember. And I recognized these are wonderful composers, these are great composers. They didn't speak to me. Mm -hmm. And I had a vague notion of um, something I wanted to do which would be American, but not in the Copeland sense, American in the sense of, of Melville, maybe, or Faulkner, um, something that would be large, but would sense the, the uh, uh, also the tragedies of America. Mm -hmm. And um, it was just a sort of vague sense. And in the midst of this, people mentioned the name Elliot Carter to me. and. Um, uh, I had played as an undergraduate a piece of his, I no longer remember, an early piece for um, uh, something, I can't remember, flute or clarinet and piano. Mm -hmm. And I didn't like it at all. It was very much like Copeland and I didn't right. like it at all. And so uh, being very young, I knew, you know, I made, an I had made a judgment that was final. And people kept telling me, you should look at Elliot Carter. And I said, I, no, I, you know, I know he's a terrible composer. Mm -hmm. And one day, which is a day in my life I'll never forget. Um, uh, Arthur Berger had a, a Xerox uh, copy of the first quartet of mm -hmm. he, he And he said, well, I'll lend this to you. Why don't you look at it? And I thought, OK. And I thought, oh, well, I'll have a look at it. Why not? And before going home, I went to a Hayes Baker caf cafeteria uh, for a cup of coffee. And I sat over that cup of coffee for three hours or something <laughs> like that. I could not tear myself away from uh -huh. that piece. And for the next three or four, it was what I was looking for, mm -hmm. for the next three or four months, I would say, there was, I did nothing else. I stayed in my room, cooked my own meals, and just read that piece over and over and over. I remember while I was cooking supper, turning on the radio and catching a late Beethoven quartet, mm -hmm. listening a few to do it for a few minutes and then deciding nothing interested. <laughs> a late Peter <laughs> and went back to my car first. And um, it was really for me the liberating experience. And then I, I began to write my first quartet, 
and um, and really liberating in the sense that my first quartet, almost nobody, nor do I see any Carter in it. I, I, there was something about that piece that that spoke mm -hmm. and liberated my own voice or whatever I had at that time, and um, so there were no. Um, um, rhythmic modulations, and there were uh, not, not his usual tetrachord, all interval tetrachord, and all his other, mm -hmm. all the other things that are prominent in the first quartet, they weren't there at all. So it was really liberating. Is maybe uh, it was liberating in a sense that wasn't uh, a compositional sense, but maybe more psychological. Mm -hmm. What I'm thinking of is that you, and, and this would lead in another direction with with the talk, with, with with what you're saying, and another question that I might have. Uh, one of the things, and I'm not going to remember the quote exactly, but one of the famous quotes uh, from Elliot Carter was uh, when he was reflecting on writing the first quartet, and he went to the desert. Yeah. Moved to the desert for right. a year, or, or right. not quite a year. Right. And he, looking back, he said, uh, "What I wanted to do was to write what I wanted to write." And I wanted to say to hell with the performer and to hell with yes. the audience. Yes. And those are his own words, not yes. mine. <laughs> yes. yes. No, I know. And that. and I was wondering if that's maybe, even though you didn't have that quote available at the time, that somehow is what resonated with you as far as liberating. Not not the uh, anything about the audience uh -huh. or writing what I wanted. Nothing like that, and I, and I was too young to think of an audience, you know. He, right. He uh -huh. was of an age where he would have to, but I, w I wasn't. No, what I was responding to was the long line. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, the, um, uh, what I was looking for in something American, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that would represent the continent, but in a rather, you know, in a way that was not just, isn't it wonderful here? Mm -hmm. <laughs> But in a way that um, you know had everything, and um, and I remained absolutely devoted for the next four or five pieces that mm -hmm. came from him. They just uh, <coughs> uh, you know I just trembled to get them. Right. And uh, yet, my own music is not like that. At right. All. <laughs> and that just happens to be so. I wasn't. It be. And then other things after that, of course, came, um, you know, were very influential and important to me. Mm -hmm. well, do you consider that, that first quartet that you wrote then, uh, in a sense, to be um, your first piece of music? Or, I mean, it's not, a, it's not it, I'm saying, is this a case of, this is where I begin? Yes, it is, I would say mm -hmm. it's, it is my first piece of music. And I haven't thought about it for a million years, nor listened to it, nor read it. But I am very sure that there's an awful lot of it that I would not like now. Yeah. That it was still, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, in the making. Uh -huh. But, um, yeah, that, okay. that, that was the beginning. Um, after you got back from Vienna, then... Um, well, I, well, I wanted to just sort of uh, maybe catch up on a couple uh, of other people, uh, or just one other person, really, uh, and that is uh, Steuermann. Mm -hmm. um, when, when was it that you studied piano with him? Uh, my last year of high school, which would have been uh, 46 to 47. Okay, okay. Is there anything, uh, since he's kind of another looming large figure in the world that a lot of people don't know about uh, as much as they ought to, uh, is, is there anything you can say that you remember about him as a oh, sure. teacher? And yeah, he, uh, I brought him whatever pieces I was looking at. Uh -huh. um, I remember some uh, Scriabin about which he was rather contemptuous, but mm -hmm. he didn't mind that I, you know, he helped me play it. Uh, but he used the occasion to talk to me. I mean, he talked about Schoenberg, of course, mm -hmm. and about Berg and about Weber. And the talk was talk. Mm -hmm. But another enormous event in my very early life was I came early for a lesson, 
and he was with some other guy. It could have been a pianist, could have been a composer. They were talking. I didn't hear what they were saying. Um, but one of them, I guess it would have been him, started playing something at the piano, and it was the first atonal music I ever heard. Um, Do you remember which? I have no idea okay. what it was. It wasn't Schoenberger. You don't well, remember. Yeah. It probably it could have been either, yeah. but I have no idea. Uh -huh. I presume it was another composer. It could have been his music. Mm -hmm. uh, it could have been Gunther Schuller. I don't know who, you mm -hmm. know. <laughs> um, but it was the first time I heard that, and I was bowled over by it. Um, I was terribly interested, and I mm -hmm. had, had never heard anything like that before. Mm -hmm. and it, it really grabbed me. And that year, then I began to, I borrowed Schoenberg from the library and started playing Schoenberg and played it for him. And also my freshman year at Harvard, I, uh, you know, then I got involved in, 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 in Schoenberg and the Viennese school very much. Also Berg, Wozzeck, which of course speaks heavily mm -hmm. to, to a teenager. Right. And uh, until I got to Harvard, where Neo which was the, um, the neoclassic center of the world, and I was the telling them, yeah. you don't do that. <laughs> right. But I also discovered, which continues to shock me, that on the Harvard faculty, I played some Schoenberg, you know, in a little group there, freshman year, sophomore year maybe, and on the Harvard faculty, nobody had ever heard a note of Schoenberg before. This was their first experience. Mm -hmm. And they thought I was so wonderful there, I was playing that, but I, I'm sure I wasn't that wonderful. <laughs> I'm sure it was just the first time they had right. the experience of this music. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's interesting. That because, uh, the, well, there, I don't know if, that there's been a turnaround at, at Harvard. You're, you're talking about Harvard. If this is Harvard back then. Yes, right. No, yeah, no, no. Right. Harvard then became, uh, absolutely. Right. Yeah. Uh, this is not Harvard forever. There are still, I think, elements, but <laughs> any, at any rate, um, after, uh, after your uh, Fulbright in Vienna, you uh, returned to the United States in 1955, and uh, from what I gather, uh, maybe the first uh, major thing that you did was uh, your involvement with uh, f the formation of the Brandeis Chamber Ensemble. Or were you someplace else before that? Uh, no. Um, there was a gap, I don't remember how long, before I went up to Brandeis. And then I was asked, when I was first hired there, it was just to do six concerts of contemporary music. Okay. So there was no ensemble. There was me and uh, me trying to scrounge to get um, um, players. Mm -hmm. And, um, were players of new music difficult to come by no, back then? No, mm -hmm. and they still are not. No, when they're young, they're fine. Yeah. Um, and uh, for me personally, because I'd been in Europe two years, I asked Arthur Arthur Berger to give me a list of composers, and um, I wrote to them. And I, I do have to tell you, being very young and stupid. I, knowing they wouldn't know my name, I signed Arthur Berger's name. <laughs> and I signed it as Professor Berger, and he was furious because these composers, with whom he was a very close friend, right. got names, got addre addressed to Professor Professor so-and-so and signed Professor Berger. <laughs> and they said, what have I done to Arthur? <laughs> but um, as re what I remember from that first year was the music that I got from um, Andy Imbri and from Seymour Schifrin. Mm -hmm. And eventually Seymour came to Brandeis and we became very close friends and he was a very important factor in my life. Mm -hmm. in, in what ways? Uh, musically, personally? or uh, In every possible way, personally uh -huh. too. Uh, but from the first piece I got from him, which actually was a tonal piece, uh, I was, I thought, uh, this is wonderful music and it, it made a very strong impression on me. Mm -hmm. And we showed each other our music constantly, and uh -huh. he was also an absolutely brilliant musician. Um, and he should be played a lot now. This was 55, 56? Or uh, when he came to Brandeis would have been after um, Irving Fine passed away, so that would have been early 60s probably. Okay, okay. It's a little, it's a little uh -huh. later. But uh, my contact with his music began 
that first year, whenever, sure. whenever I started it at Brandeis. Well, I, I just asked, because, and I'm not uh, trying to belabor the year uh, that things happened, except in that I think that it's really important that there, there was a lot of shifting going on as far as styles, uh, yes. compositional styles and, yes. and things that were going on, the Schoenberg-Stravinsky thing and, and everything. And I think that people were reevaluating or Absolutely. tossing out or embracing and, and doing all of these Absolutely. things. And I, it's, it's interesting. D did you yourself were in a tonal period then and you made a shift? Only, only when I was an undergraduate studying with Piston and then studying with, with Hinden. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. After that, uh, no, and, and much of the music we played that first year was the Beanie School, mm -hmm. was Schoenberg and whatever Weber we could do. Uh -huh. And somewhere along that time, the other really important influence on me was the work of Weber, uh -huh. which is the only work that didn't immediately grab me that I had to study. Right. And I did study it, mm -hmm. and then it grabbed me. I remember the day uh, as a student that uh, a certain uh, um, professor told me, just said, mentioned the words that the most important piece of the 20th century was the Opus 21 Symphony. Uh -huh. And uh, that made me go look at it yes. <laughs> yes. a little bit more intensely than I would have. Yes. And that may not be the judgment anymore, but it's certainly, certainly, Oh, it uh, remains, was important. It remains an. Uh, I mean, he yeah. he is a very very major composer. Right. That cannot be denied. Um, let me see. Um, oh yes, I I was going to. Uh, this was not a sidetrack because this was this is uh, you're you're speaking exactly uh, in the direction that I want. But uh, we the question was about the Brandeis Chamber Ensemble, and how and how that came about. You said that you were. Uh, asked to do a series of concerts, right. but then uh, when did Brandeis sort of say we want this as a permanent thing? Uh, shortly after it, uh, they wanted a, a string quartet. Okay. And because uh, I was doing it alone, and it was fly by night, um, and then they hired Robert Kopf from the Juilliard Quartet. He um, and he left the Juilliard Quartet. Mm -hmm. Um, and because of him, then the violist was um, uh, Lehner, Eugene Lehner, mm -hmm. who had been the violist of the Kolisch Quartet in New Schoenberg and Bartok intimately. Right. Yeah. And um, Madeline Foley was the cellist who had uh, been, who knew Casals very well and mm -hmm. had been at, in the Casals Festival in the south of France. And that remained uh, along with me, that quartet with me, and then occasional people um, uh, hired in addition as we needed them, became the, the, the mm -hmm. first Brandeis Chamber Ensemble. And you yourself were uh, uh, doing recital work with different people at the time, weren't you? I needed to earn a living. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I was playing for any singer or any violinist who, who needed yeah, but Who they needed were me. not any singers or violinists. So, but. Some of them were wonderful, some of yeah. them were less. I did anything. <laughs> I needed the money, you know. Right. When was it that you were, uh, I know that you were a pianist for the Boston Symphony for a while. For one year. Also, oh, okay. I needed the money. Uh -huh. uh, it was, uh, Leinsdorf was the conductor. Okay. Uh -huh. It's the only time before now I, uh, I got to Washington because the symphony was asked to play at the White House. Oh, really? And I was in the program, so I got who to see the White House. Who was president at that time? Um, blah, 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 blah. Uh, it wasn't, was it in the late 50s? It wasn't Eisenhower, was no, it? No, no it okay. was not Eisenhower. And, um, oh, that's okay. That's, it was, it might have been Carter, but I'm not sure. It was, it was in oh, the okay. 60s at some point. Okay. Uh -huh. I just don't remember Leinsdorf up here in the, in the Boston at the White House, but it's <laughs> certainly possible. It's, things might be happening again, <laughs> But, um, Or it might see. have been Kennedy. No, no it wouldn't, I think Johnson. It was Johnson. Johnson? It was Johnson. That's okay. what it was. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, the th one of the things that uh, interests me about uh, 
the Brandeis Chamber Ensemble. And we talked before about how uh, whether they they were the model or not, uh, you did something with a repertoire that uh, was l done later by the Group for Contemporary Music at Columbia, yeah. and uh, and I'm not sure I recall any other group doing this before the Brandeis Chamber Ensemble, where there is a mix of the very old and and the very new. Right. Uh, how did that idea come about? You said that you started out by just doing contemporary music, but who or how did the idea come about of mixing it with what Peritan or um, the f well the first I think I, I'm not I can't fully remember when Bobby joined us, but I think I was alone for two years, uh -huh. maybe three, but. I do remember vividly by the second year. So I was doing strictly contemporary music, mm -hmm. but I added to it because I became very interested in those very complicated rhythmic things from the end of the 14th century right. in uh, from Provence. And Isorhythmic motets and things? Uh, yeah, but uh, things that are so complicated that you c can't easily read them today, uh -huh. as complicated as anything in the 20th century. Right. Uh -huh. And... Um, so we put some of that on, and so in that sense, um, it had started a little earlier when Bobby came. Um, now Bobby Cuff. Oh, okay, okay. The, uh -huh. uh, who became really the, the director of performance because mm -hmm. I then began to teach um, theory and analysis and mm -hmm. that sort of thing. Um, then we mixed old and new. Mm -hmm. And I'm proud of the fact that for many years the old music was, I mean, the new music was, uh, we solicited scores, just send us anything. And I read absolutely very carefully every single score. Mm -hmm. And it was entirely on the basis of, um, of the quality of the score. Mm -hmm. So I got to know quite a lot of the music that was being written at that mm -hmm. time. Uh, by playing it and merely by reading it. Mm -hmm. um, I really wanted to know. Um, we sort of you were, you've sort of laid a groundwork for for everything, but your own technique currently and and has been for some time is 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 rooted pretty much in um, uh, twelve tone technique. Uh, and um, um, serialisms of various kinds, possibly. Uh, and I'm always interested in how serialism develops within, a, especially within a single composer. And I was wondering in the beginning, how did this come about? Was it? I mean, uh, you you were studying Schoenberg and uh, sure. and, and the uh, yeah, Second absolutely. Viennese School at the time. Absolutely. Uh, so so. That's what, it was the actual music itself that had been written that convinced you that you this was a direction you should take it in. Mm -hmm. How did you take it in your own personal direction, though? I guess that's the question. Well, it actually began with that first piece, the first quartet. Uh -huh. Parts of it do have they're not complete twelve tone sets, but they are um, there are sets. There may even be twelve tone sets in there. I can't remember. Mm -hmm. um, um, and then I, I, I did that for a, through a great many pieces, through a, many years, uh, using 12 tones, a 12 tone set. I never cheated, I never added a note that I wasn't supposed to or left out one. Um, but I was never interested in letting it determine the piece. Mm -hmm. The piece had to make its own statement. And so I think in the end it was a way of, of um, just having an overview of how the the pitches were moving, how mm -hmm. the twelve were moving, you know, um, keeping an eye on them or an ear on them, and um, um, in sort of finding harmony. Uh, I can't be specific on harmony that that I wanted. Mm -hmm. As a result, in recent years, I haven't been doing it anymore, mm -hmm. and although there are a couple of recent pieces where I entertain myself by doing it in a couple of the movements and not in other 
movement. And I have asked people, so which is, which is serial and which isn't, and nobody can tell, mm -hmm. which makes me very happy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I, I have, uh, the most recent pieces, I haven't been using it. But I think the, you know, what it, whatever I have to say, the, the, the sense of it is unbroken. It, mm -hmm. It's not dictated. By the uh, by sets. Mm -hmm. When uh, so, I'm trying to get a, a a feel for how a set would work into a piece. Then, is it difficult? Is it just too difficult to say because it's it's close to intuitive? Well, uh, I could put it this way. I mean, I I think the process of writing it was. I have so much music now here. Mm -hmm. uh, what is the what should come next? Mm -hmm. And I may have a sense. I want this pitch. I want this something, and uh, f that's dictated by the piece mm -hmm. as it's there. And uh, then I, the choice of the set form mm -hmm. uh, would um, would flow from that. Okay. So I would pick it. And many pieces do have many set forms going together, and um, uh, but it's in that sense that it is intuitive, uh, whatever that word means. But, sure, yeah, I, but for me, it means that uh, my my sense of writing pieces has always been the piece knows what it wants, the mm -hmm. piece knows what it should do, and I'm too stupid to know it. <laughs> and what I usually do is what what I did the last time. Uh -huh. In the last piece, you know right. that I know how to do, so I do it again, and of course mm -hmm. it's it's terrible. So I cross it out, I get rid of it, and then eventually, I, I'm trying to listen to the piece, what the discourse has gone so far, what is the next thing? Mm -hmm. the, okay. Um. When you say different forms of the row, I won't belabor this, but um, are you, do you consciously tra do uh, work transformations on a given row that you've decided to work with uh, to other than the usual uh, uh, canonic transformations of retrograde inversion? I was I was thinking of just those okay. the, the usual okay. tra uh, of transposition okay. retrograde, etc. Except uh, I do remember now um, there are some pieces that do use uh, transformations. Um, and if you ask me which pieces, I wouldn't know. That's, I can't remember. Okay. I, 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 this is not. It just rings a bell in my mind. I have done that too. <laughs> okay, you used. Uh, uh, we can maybe uh, uh, get away from that just a little bit, but um, you used a um, a word uh, discourse. Um, I think in, in in describing what you do, I'm. First of all, I'm interested in the the compositional process, what you go through, and the technical aspects sort of get us into that. Uh, and I'm not going to ask you to, you know, what inspires you. I mean, you're a human being, so yeah. we and yeah. we only have a certain limited amount of time. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes, but uh, but how you work is a, a bit of interest to me. Uh, if um, unless you don't want to get into it too much. But uh, do you find yourself working in long periods, long stretches to do a piece and then going away from it and coming back? Or are you basically, do you think of yourself as composing all the time? I know that it's difficult for some composer, or easy for some composers to come up with a minute of music, for example, and, uh, and difficult for others. And that can vary as well. That's the kind of thing that I'm, I'm oh, wondering uh, what you're... Two things there. No, um, yeah. I really can only work at one piece at a time, mm -hmm. and I, unless I've had to, I don't move away from it mm -hmm. and do something else. Um, but um, uh, oh, I've lost the train. There was something else you said. That, uh, well, the difficulty of coming up with one. Oh, music, oh, oh, for oh, example. Oh, oh, yeah, right. Uh, I revise endlessly. Uh -huh. It is not easy for me to get it right. There are very few times in my life where it's been right the first time. Mm -hmm. And the older I've gotten and the more experienced, the more I am willing to throw away a whole section mm -hmm. that 
is very good by itself. Mm -hmm. But you have to have enough experience to um, have the confidence. This might be good, but it doesn't belong here. Get rid right, of it. Right. And you'll, you will come up with the right one. Mm -hmm. Just take your time. Do you save those efforts? No. Too bad. <laughs> um, oh, they may be in the sketches, which you, yeah. which you will have. Right. That's what I'm, I'm talking about. I know, about. Uh, but they are so chaotic. I, right. When I look at them, I haven't a clue as to what I was yeah. doing or even... I think they're divided by pieces, but I, <laughs> I don't envy anybody who ever wants to look at them. <laughs> Do you sketch a lot when you write? Enormously. Okay. It's over and over. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it really takes me a while to get it right. Mm -hmm. um, and something you said reminded me of another question, and that is the possible friction between the composition and teaching. A, a composer generally, a serious composer in the United States, well, just about any place, has to make a living. It's like you said yeah, in other things. Yeah. And that generally means uh, teaching and often means uh, the, in the university setting where uh, requirements of administrations may be differ different than what a professor's uh, requirements are. And I was wondering if that is ever a friction for you no. between teaching and no. composing. No. I have found that, that teaching, uh, particularly teaching graduate uh, mm -hmm. composers, um, um, you know, I love doing it. It's kind of an extension. Then. It's an extension. You know, I'm, uh, I'm looking at a piece and, and after talking to them, to, um, asking what is it you want me to hear here? Do you want me to hear a close here? Do you want me to hear the piece to do this? And then I say, but as you've written it, it doesn't do that. It does uh -huh. something else. And um, that kind of contact with music is wonderful. Mm -hmm. And having just retired, you know, that uh, I will miss. The rest, the administrative stuff, I will never miss. <laughs> yeah, and that's kind of what I was talking about more yeah. than anything. The actual oh. classroom situation, the oh, paperwork. The, uh, that's yeah, that. Right. Yeah, but I know. But one has to feel blessed because mm -hmm. people who don't have that jobs. Oh, sure. You know, they have no time to work, and anybody who has an academic job, a composer in America, uh, and does not write music has no excuse. Mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> there is enough time to do it. Uh -huh. Do you uh, agree with the, the uh, with, uh, <laughs> it's, almost, it's almost sad to bring this up, but uh, I thought of it, now I have to bring it up. Uh, the famous slash infamous uh, Milton Babbitt essay uh, which got incorrectly titled, uh, Who oh, Cares If You Listen, yeah. uh, which was originally uh, the composer the comp as, uh, as... As specialist. As specialist. Yeah. I've often wondered, and, I've, and, I should, and I'm going to have to ask Milton sometime yeah. directly, yeah. would he change his opinion today as far as the university being the setting for, uh, for uh, the modern or the, the 20th century or 21st now century composer? What is your opinion? Is that the pl is that still the best bet for a composer as far as acceptance collegially and and so on? When I first started teaching, I was enormously optimistic and happy uh, because. Um, the university was also the place where performances of new music could happen, where it, you didn't write the piece because the publisher told you, you know, I'm going to drop you unless you, you get a big audience of, of 500 to 1,000 for every performance, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And so it liberated uh, every composer, and this was true. And in those early years, as I told you earlier, we had enormous crowds at Brandeis. We didn't know what to do with them. Mm -hmm. uh, coming from the university, coming also from the city of Waltham, which is a nothing city, mm -hmm. where they came. Um, everybody came. You should say the numbers that you were talking about were like um, a, a, a single concert would... would well, the, a single concert, I mean, the whole holds, I don't know, 200 or 300. Uh -huh. But then the lobby would have, uh, maybe uh, uh, it had to be piped out to the lobby, sure. so there was another hundred maybe in the lobby, and then we would, we were uh, refusing entry to another two hundred who couldn't mm -hmm. get in. 
and we used to sit around thinking maybe we should sell it, maybe we should make it expensive. What can we do to keep people away? <laughs> because it became a, a problem. It's a very different situation than from today. It's yeah. very different from yeah. today. And I thought, uh, you know, America is really the place that now supplants what was the old European court, mm -hmm. uh, where the great pieces of the past were written. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and what could be better? And that has not lasted. Mm -hmm. uh, it still is. We have, um, even in recent years, the applications for um, graduate study in, in composition come from all over, mm -hmm. all over America, from people who have had not much education in music. They have a calling and they want it. Mm -hmm. And of course we get lots of applications from people who are very well educated and the most well educated are from uh, uh, Taiwan, um, mainland China, mm -hmm. Japan, and Korea. Yeah. Not even Japan, not even Europe. Right. Not even Europe. They are the ones and, and they're wonderful. Mm -hmm. And we've had from Europe too, so mm -hmm. that, uh, you know, people all over. Uh, we had a, an enormously gifted English student a few years ago, and I asked him, um, you know, why he came to America and what he. What sort of education he had in, in England, uh, he's from a poor family outside of London, and he said, well, I, the only music I knew there was on the was rock on the radio, and that's all. Mm -hmm. And then he said, I came to America to go to the Berklee School for pop music in Boston, mm -hmm. where I got a degree. Then I got interested in jazz, and I went to the New England Conservatory and got a degree in that, and then I got interested in classical music. And he was writing very original stuff mm -hmm. at that point as a young man mm -hmm. from nowhere. Right. So, you know, in that sense, it, it always is very refreshing. Mm -hmm. <coughs> we are actually maybe a melting pot every once in a while. Maybe. Yeah, oh, yeah. Still, oh. still to this day. Defin definitely in, in music yeah. departments. Yeah. Um, Oh boy, you've given so many routes to go now. Let's see. Uh, <laughs> let's talk a little bit about um, go, going back to uh, the word discourse uh, suggests a narrative. And that suggests to me um, a book that you wrote uh, fairly recently, 2005? 2004 is the publication date. Yeah, right. so it's seven. So right. it would have been finished 2003 right. or something. The book is uh, Silence and Slow Time, and it's uh, studies in musical narrative, uh, and it's uh, published by um, I know the uh, Scarecrow, Scarecrow Press. Uh, it's become a kind of favorite book of mine, um, and so uh, I definitely would um, suggest it, especially for uh, people who are interested in the internals of music. Uh, and so we're getting back to theory a little bit. But there's more than just theory in here, and especially in the last chapter. Um, but I was wondering if, uh, sp speaking specifically about this, if you, uh, first of all, have anything to say about the history of writing this book. Why did you write it? Uh, it grew out of uh, the retirement of one of America's foremost theorists, David Lewin, mm -hmm. uh, and he had uh, the way the, uh, he was a professor at Harvard at that point. And what they do there is they ask the retiree to um, um, to say what subject he would like covered and to have a concert and lectures on that subject, not by him. He's not allowed to do anything; he just has to enjoy. Um, and I guess he asked me to do a, a lecture on the Schoenbeck Trio, which I had taught for quite a few years. And after, the, after it was over, they had decided to publish all the lectures. Well, unfortunately, as a non-scholar, I had done mine off the cuff. Everybody else had a nice printed thing, so I asked them to send me the uh, tape of this. And when I read the tape, I realized it was useless that one, the sentences were all incomplete, and that um, I would have to write it. So I be, that was actually the genesis uh -huh. 
of the um, uh, of the book. There was another genesis I, I want to say, and that is um, I'm having a senior moment. I'm forgetting. There was I was asked to be on a, a, a tenure committee for a um, theorist at Columbia, mm -hmm. and I had to read his papers. Um, and uh, if I, if you give me a minute, because oh I, yeah, no, take I, your time. I do want to. Um, That was the Schoenberg Conference for David Lewin. That's As right. I, I was there, actually. Ah. Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm now remembering. I do apologize for this. No, that's take your time. I know his name as well as my own, and um, it's somebody I mentioned several times in the book, and having read his work, uh, I was very interested. Mm -hmm. uh, there were uh, essays on Haydn and an essay on Milton's music. and. Um, uh, in some sense, he. Uh, I, I wrote the book in, in response to having read his work, and um, he continues to teach at Columbia, where he is now a tenured professor. Uh, Joe Dubiel. Oh, Joe Dubiel. Yes. yes. Uh -huh. I'm okay. sorry. I'm sorry. I, I, was, I apologize. I'm glad I didn't blurt out a couple of the names that I was thinking. <laughs> um, no, Joe is, is, uh, is wonderful. Mm -hmm. Was it in, uh, you say in response, was it opposition or in agreement? No, 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 in agreement. Uh -huh. Absolutely okay. in agreement. And, uh, you know, I quote him uh, on, in three of the essays mm -hmm. uh, uh, saying, as he said, and, uh, and some of those essays were really, re you know, I took it in another direction or whatever, but uh, in response, no in agreement to his general way uh -huh. of thinking of music. Um, and I would say he was he was the founding father of that book. Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> okay. Uh, as as far as um, the idea of narrative uh, and your approach uh, to music, uh, according to to uh, what you say in here, is that uh, is is basically a narrative approach. Uh, could you say something about that? Yeah, and the first thing I would say is I regret the word narrative. Yeah. <laughs> the next thing I would say I is think I, I know why, but go I regret ahead. the word discourse uh -huh. um, because I have a firm belief in what scientists tell us, and that is that music is at the opposite side of the brain from right. language. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so that's a metaphor. Right. And it's not a good one. And um, what it really means is that we experience, and this is so obvious that one shouldn't have to say it but people seem not to notice it. Mm -hmm. And it's as obvious as the fact that water is wet. And that is that we experience music as time. Mm -hmm. uh, from the past, present, to the future. And what we're experiencing is only the present. Uh, the, but the present as it is colored by what we remember mm -hmm. of what went before. And uh, it's, that's it's only in that sense. Okay. Okay. Uh, and 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 so in that sense, when you, when one becomes familiar with a piece of music, in in your mind, is there a prefiguring that comes in at that point, where you are looking forward to, as well as looking back on what you remember? You're looking forward 